Hey there, I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors of the downtown campus. Just want to welcome you today, and I hope you'll enjoy this teaching from God's Word. big hand to the praise team and the great job those guys do. Yeah, hopefully they could uh, hear that as they're walking back to their room. We're in a series called Values, and we're teaching through the core values of our church. These values help clarify what matters most, kind of keep us focused. You can see there in the graphic our mission, which is connect to Jesus, grow together, and then go serve. And so all of our core values fall under those three categories. So I'm going to do a quick review of where we've been. The first three values fall under connect. Those are connect values. And the first one was connect to thrive. This is the foundational value, that people connect with Jesus. Because if you miss Jesus, you miss the whole point, right? So connecting to Jesus and his body, his family, and, and thriving in something like a life group where you can really uh, be known and know others and grow. Second is people matter. People matter, no matter, no matter what, what you've been through, what's happened to you, uh, what you've done, whatever. You know, God loves you, and there's a home for you here uh, at River Valley. Third, real and relevant. The coming to God and being real and being real with each other and being real with our culture, relevant, very, very important, and this pleases, pleases the Lord. Then we moved into the grow values. Last week we saw value four, which was we can't, God can the only way to live the Christian life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Depending more, trusting, relying is the best trying. And then today, our fifth value is passionate Jesus followers. Joyfully loving God and loving one another and his word uh, is uh, what we're talking about uh, today. Passionate Jesus followers. The simple reason we do this is because he's better, right? If we could find something else better then I'd say follow, follow that. But there's nothing and no one that compares to Jesus. He's the true goat. Okay? You guys know what goat means, right? What's goat mean? Greatest, greatest of all time. Not Tom Brady. <laughs> Although, yeah, he's the a, he's a greatest quarterback. I will admit it. Okay. Um, but Jesus is the greatest of all time. He is better. And... Uh, he, he today has for us a passage. He's going to tell us right out of Mark chapter 8. Like he's standing here today talking to us about what it means to follow him uh, with passion. Not just to be a Christian. Not just to go to church. But to be a passionate follower of Christ. So in this text, we deal with the three very important questions. Who's Jesus? What did he do? And what does that mean for us? So our big idea today so that Jesus' identity and his activity determines our destiny. So what Jesus is and what he did determines what we uh, do. So first of all, Jesus' identity. Who is he? So we pick up with verse 27 of this chapter, and Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? In other words, what's the talk on the street? What's the, what's the political polls today? All right? what, what are people saying about me? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. Now, these were some pretty good answers, pretty high praise. One of the prophets, John the Baptist. Just like today, you know, who do you think of Jesus? Uh, he's a great teacher. Uh, you know, he, he's a prophet. He was a wonderful man. Now, then, just like uh, today, Jesus is not satisfied with any of those answers. They don't go nearly far enough. And so he asks his disciples, what do you think? Right? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And actually, the Greek construction, you is the first word. You. What do you think I am? Who do you think that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. So I think I've told you before that Christ is not Jesus' last name. He's not Mr. Christ. Uh, Christ is his title. Christ is the Greek word of the Hebrew word Messiah. Messiah, think God's anointed king to rule the world. That's who Jesus is. 
And so, you know, ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. Peter's right. He gets it right. Jesus, you're the Messiah. Verse 30 says, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him, which is strange. Jesus, he goes anti-evangelist here. He says, don't tell anybody. And there's some reasons for that we don't have time to get into, but one that I want to point out, very important, because the disciples are correct about his identity, but they're mistaken about his activity. They're mistaken about his mission. Like they know who he is, but they're confused about what he came to do. And Jesus wants them to understand that and to get that. It's very important if they're going to be his disciples. So let's talk, number two, about Jesus' activity. What's his mission? What they thought is that Jesus would come and give leadership to the nation of Israel and defeat all of their enemies and set up his political kingdom. Where they got that was from the Old Testament. All, throughout the Old Testament, the Messiah is going to be this world leader. So they weren't wrong on that. So let me put it this way. They were right about his ultimate mission, which is ruling the world. But they missed his immediate mission, which is the cross. So check out what he says uh, next here. This must have totally blown him away. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. That's the whole religious establishment is going to reject Jesus. And he must be killed and after three days rise again. This is absolutely shocking to these guys who since they were little kids, it's been ingrained in them that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be this political ruler for their country. And Israel's going to prosper greatly. He's going to take the throne. So this idea of him dying, they're thinking, if you're Messiah, you can't be killed. But Jesus says, I must. I have to be. Nothing good can happen in this world without me dying, Jesus says. Nothing good can happen in your life or mine without Jesus dying on that cross. So God's solution for a suffering world is a suffering Savior. A suffering Savior. Not a crown of gold, but a crown of thorns. Now I need to point out that the Old Testament uh, does teach that before Jesus rules as king of the world, literally, that he's going to suffer and die as the servant. Isaiah 53 is very clear. For some reason, they just missed it. That's not what they wanted to hear. That's not what they were taught. Even to this day, tragically, our Jewish friends collectively have missed the Messiah. They're still waiting. He came. Jesus came over 2,000 years ago. He came to build a spiritual kingdom first, but eventually one day he's going to build, I hope soon, by the way, he's going to build his true kingdom when he comes a second time. Oh, what a great day that's going to be. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this, which is his death, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Peter, he's not, he's not buying it. Like, Jesus, you're going all negative. You're talking about dying and stuff. Like, Jesus, I'm your campaign manager, and this is not working for me. Okay? Like, you're going against the script here. and Because a Messiah can't suffer. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, verse 33, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. All right, so uh, hot tip, note to self. If Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> uh, that's never good. And because Peter, as it says here, he's missing the concerns of God. He's only thinking uh, humanly speaking. You're missing it, Peter. And then Jesus calls a timeout. Verse 34, he gathers his disciples, and there's others there. He says he called the crowd to him. He says, huddle up. And he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I put daily in parentheses because Luke, in his gospel, adds daily. So this is the more full uh, saying that Jesus uh, tells us here. Uh, must deny. If you want to follow, you want to be a Christian, 
must deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow. Anyone and everyone who would say, I believe, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian, deny themselves, take up their cross and follow. Now, I don't think we understand what a bizarre statement that was, especially in that culture. We think of cross, we're thinking of religious art, we're thinking of jewelry, we're thinking of, you know, like a nice cross on a wall. They didn't have any of that stuff. They had one thought when the cross was mentioned, and that was Roman execution. That's how Rome put people to death, mainly that way. Brutal, brutal execution. In fact, one example, a hundred years before Jesus lived on the earth, there was a slave uprising in the Roman Empire. It was led by a man named Russell Crowe. No, just kidding. Just seeing if you're listening. It was led by Spartacus. 70% of the population were slaves. And so this ended up being a major battle. It lasted a long time, but eventually the army put it down. And to make a statement, they took 6,000 slaves and crucified them all at the same time along the road between uh, Rome and Kupoa, 120 miles of crucifixions. If my math is correct, that's one every 100 feet. Crosses. So I share that because that's what people would have had in mind. Like that's take up your cross. Make no mistake about it, Jesus he, he's saying, look, be willing to give your life. Be willing to lay, he's talking about martyrdom. Like we're really good at, especially, you know, pastors like me, we go metaphorical here. We say like, oh, he's talking about like being willing to deny yourself and be willing to, you know, surrender your life and your way and your agenda. And we, we tend to go soft on what Jesus um, mainly was saying. Now, he's also talking about denying self and surrendering our lives and all that, of course. But don't miss, like at the heart of what Jesus is saying is a willingness that my life comes to an end when I come to Jesus as my Savior. To willing to give our lives, if that's likely never to happen to us, thankfully in this country, but it has, has happened and happens all over the world. Verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Wow. See, Jesus is saying we're not just saved to have a ticket to heaven. And I hope you have that ticket. It's important to be saved. But it's not just to have a ticket to heaven. It's not just to have a good, better life. It's very clear here. We are saved so that we would be people of passion. We would be people of put him as number one. We would have a life of surrender. It's not just inviting Jesus into our life. It's having a surrendered life. And I'm not making this up. Like, this is what Jesus says. Like, if you want to follow me, this is his playbook. This is what he is uh, talking about. That's passion for him. Again, um, hopefully not a have to, but a get to. Because he's better. Jesus is better. He's completely worthy of all this. And he did it himself. Laying down his life. We get mixed up. Because we get so much of ourself involved in this, my life, my, you know. I mean, think about our whole society. It's all, even Christianity is kind of marketed today. Analyze self, kind of pamper self, protect yourself, promote uh, yourself, you know, find yourself. Jesus like, how about this? Deny yourself. Forget yourself. And move into life. So passionate Jesus followers, that's what we're talking about. That there's one way to follow Jesus, pedal down, 100%. Not like one foot in, one foot out. What is that, the hokey pokey? Remember that? Put one foot in. It's like, it's like no, no, 
going all in. I mean, kind of encouraging. You don't have to be smart. Don't have to be qualified. Don't have to be popular. Don't have to be any of that. You just got to be all in. So a couple things about this. First, following Jesus is countercultural. That's why I can kind of sense it here today. You're like, whoa, this is like a little different kind of a mess. Like, this is like, this is where the rubber hits the road. Like, Jesus is calling us out. He's calling us to a higher, to, to, to higher way of thinking and living. It's countercultural. Like, there, there are people that think they can become a Christian and stay the same. Like, what? No, our life becomes his. Like, our time, we're gonna, our time is going to, how we spend our time will be different, how we spend our money different, our values are going to change, our, our morality, our dreams. Again, this is a get to. We get to change. And we should because we're Jesus people. The kingdom of God is completely different. It's the upside down, or I should say right side up kingdom. You know, because the last will be first and the first, you know, be last. And, and, and the greatest among you is the one who serves. R- wrong is right and right is wrong. And, and this natural tendency is to live for ourselves. And Jesus says that's a sure way to be a loser. So it's a completely backwards kind of a thing. It's countercultural. The way to truly have life is to go the way of humility, to go to the way of serving, giving yourself for the Lord and for others. It's also radical. So the, the Jesus isn't like half, halfway slow lane. He demands everything. Matthew 22, a man came to Jesus and asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all. If you're an underliner, note taker in the Bible, mark up all, circle all. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. It's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's a, it's a vertical, passionate, all in love. And, and I, I know that passion is going to look different for different ones of us because we've got different personalities. But it's going to be noticeable that he is best, he is ultimate, he is most. And then that's going to translate horizontally to other people, loving others with everything. The whole Bible, all the law and prophets hang on these two commands. One of my favorite parables is one verse. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all that he had and bought that field. I love that story. It kind of looks like this. So this is, say, I'm out hunting. I'm out in the woods. I notice this little box kind of protruding up out of the ground. And as I kind of dig around it, I realize it's a huge box with a big old lid. And I pry it open, and it's filled with gold. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like looking around. I close it back up. I bury it, put more dirt on it, you know. And... Um, then I look at my GPS and I realize I'm on private property. Hmm, I thought I was on public land. I guess I must have crossed over the line. And I'm on private property. So, okay, first thing I do, I go and I, um, I, I find out about how much this gold is worth. That's so why I talk to somebody who knows a lot more than that than I do. And they say, Mark, if you're, what you're telling me is right, the size of the box is pure, it's probably like, you know, $40 million. I'm like, whoa. Like, okay. Then the second thing I do, now don't get into the ethics of this, by the way, okay? <laughs> We're not supposed to examine the ethics of this parable. It's, it, there's, a, there's a deeper meaning. It's about the treasure. So then the second thing I do is I then go and I go to county record and I find out who owns the property. And I, I give him a call and I say, I'd like to buy your 10 acres. And he's like, well, it's not for sale. And I'm like, just name your price. And he's like, Give me $2 million and it's sold. Well, it's not worth that at all. But I'm like, sold. Now, I don't have $2 million, so what do I do? I sell everything. I sell my house, my cars, my motorcycle, my clothes, my wife. I I sell everything. Why? Why? Well, I'm going to come up with $2 million that I don't have. I'm going, to find how, I'm going to find a way to get it. Why am I going to do that? Why am I going to go all in? 
Because of the treasure. That $40 million buried there. It's, guys, Jesus is the treasure. And when we find the treasure, we, just, we go all in with everything else. Because nothing else compares with him when we found him. Nothing else compares. Jesus said it this way in Luke 14, 26. Kind of the same principle, but comes at it from a little different perspective. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What? What's he talking about? Well, obviously we know it's not literal hate. That would contradict the whole Bible, right? In fact, we probably don't love these people enough. We need to love them more, right? So what's he saying? That our love for Jesus should be so great that all of their loves looks like hate in comparison. Nothing, a family member or whatever else you want to fill in the blank. It might be a possession, might be your career, it might be a hobby. You just love it so much. Nothing wrong with that. But our love for Jesus is so great that anything else just doesn't even compare next to. Again, we're going to have maybe different ways of expressing passion for Jesus. But all, all, all of us, that should be identifiable. People should be able to see a difference in how we talk. And we should know the difference, how we think and what matters most. Who we're depending on. What gets us most fired up. Our greatest priority should be in seeking Jesus Keeping him front and center or talking to him, thinking about him, depend, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's radical. And then three, following Jesus is future focused. And I'm not saying we shouldn't live in the present. We are very much here in the present. But this thing about living and loving Jesus has a future, a future in mind. We're talking about, we're talking about eternity. The teachings of Jesus don't make any sense if we don't see the significance of uh, of heaven, of what's beyond, all right? What Jesus, he says, live this way here because we're headed there. This is like the pregame. The next life is the real game. Uh, C.S. Lewis called this the shadow lands. That it's just kind of a shadow of what is to come. So Jesus, he's always kind of teaching within this framework to be willing to turn and deny ourselves in the temporary because of life that lasts forever. Because, like, if there's no next life, why do we deny ourselves here? We might as well just, like, go for it. Like, do whatever we, do whatever we want to do. It makes no sense to, like, live for God and live for others if there's no, like, future, there's no next life. But since there is, then that should change. It's, it's similar to all, all of you um, ladies who, who've had a baby, who, you know, your moms. Like, why would you ever do that? painful, you know, pregnancy, delivery, all that kind of stuff. Brutal, brutal, right? Why? Because of life, yeah, why? Because of life, kids, right? You can see the future. It's, you would all say, like, hey, it's, wor- it, it's worth it. So a couple challenging questions. I think these are Jesus questions right here from the text. And the first important question is, are we ready to die for him? Is there that uh, willingness? Remember, if anyone, if anyone wants to come to me, take up their cross. And it's kind of strange to talk this way, but since we're on this topic, I will, that, that what if a gunman came in here? I mean, it's happened. It's happened a couple times in our country. We hope it never happens again. It happens all the time in other countries. But a gunman comes in here and says, all true Christians... Go up against this wall, you're going to die. Everyone else, you can leave. So you have your opportunity to, to leave. Like, I wonder, I wonder what we would do. I wonder how many of us would actually say, yeah, I'll take that bullet. Because Jesus is better. I'm willing. Again, I hope this never has to happen. I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I'm just saying, like, be willing to, to go there. If like, like, in a lot of countries, this is fairly normal. In fact, if you're baptized in some countries, you're taking your life into your hands. Like, and we thought baptism was a sacrifice here. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're like, you might die if you get baptized in you know, some of these countries against the law. 
but to be able to say, Jesus, I love you more than life itself. So that's the first question. Second, are we ready to deny ourselves? Which is, I think, more applicable because this is like a right now, every, every, every day, every moment kind of a question. Because it says he must deny himself. So there's this natural way that we want to live. And I struggle with this all the time, especially I'm, it's not my fourth message giving this here. And it's like, man, I, I, I have this battle. I realize I want to, I want to do me. I want to, I want to focus on me. I want to, you know, what, what, what do I want? What feels good? And make decisions according to kind of how I process through my grid. And yet Jesus is saying you got to push against that, that you have to kind of go, go countercultural and move into life. Turn away from self. Like you hear this today, oh, just go with your heart. You know, go with your gut. Like, no, don't do that. It's typically not the way to go. And to live for self. So we're, we're told, you know, that like if someone attacks you, just attack them back. You know. Uh, Jesus is like, no, that's not what Jesus people do. We deny ourselves. Or your spouse is acting moody, just going to act moody back. And Jesus say, no. Deny yourself to move uh, in, into life. Uh, you, you get upset at someone, so just go ahead and tell all your friends. Uh, Jesus again, no, deny yourself, go counter-cultural. Or you uh, really like somebody, you're dating, well, go ahead and sleep together. Why not? Everyone else, everyone else is doing it. Jesus is like, no, intimacy comes after the wedding. Deny yourself. Uh, you are, you know, depressed or anxious or just kind of struggling. Okay, just press into more food, more TV, more pot, whatever it might be. Just, you know, medicate, shopping, whatever. Jesus is like, no, I got better than that for you. Deny yourself, right? I mean, go, go down the list. All these temptations to, uh, to, to go with what feels best. No, turn from that to move into life. A, a devotion, an affection, and a priority. And kind of how it looks, let me put verse 34 back up there on the screen. It, it looks like this, that this, this deny yourself and take up your cross, uh, the Greek construction, I don't usually go all Greek and nerd, nerd out on you, but this is really important here. Both of these verbs are aorist imperatives. And what that means is it's a one-time decision that you make. You've got to make the decision. You don't grow into it. You don't grow into, oh, someday I think maybe I'll grow and become surrendered. No, you surrender. It's like a one-time decision. And then it says daily, you make that decision every day, and then follow is present tense. So you guys see the whole picture there? Make the decision. Say, Mark, when? Uh, now. See, it's a painful message. I told you. It's really painful. <laughs> make the decision. Make the decision now. That's what this is saying. Not a week from some, from some Tuesday. Like, you make the decision. Daily. And follow, present tense, is what we're talking about. That's what Jesus is saying to us here today. Surrender uh, is a command. And like we learned last week, it's something really only Jesus can help us with. Like, we have to make that decision, but we're trusting Jesus. Jesus, you change my heart. Jesus, you ignite my passion. I'm giving you my life. I'm signing my life over to you, and you help me with this. And he will. And Jesus is the only one who can. Remember the disciples. And, and, and <laughs> those guys, they, they, they were so funny. I mean, they even lived with Jesus three years. And they were always messing things up, all the way to the cross. And they scattered. They didn't even have the courage, other than John and Peter, who was kind of hanging around. And then he denied Jesus. But, like, they're all gone. They're, 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 boy, you know, talk about cowards. And then Jesus died and rose from the dead, and the Holy Spirit came. And what happened to those guys? They got fired up. They went all in. Eleven of the twelve died as martyrs, gave their lives for Jesus. By the way, that's one of the reasons you know Christianity is true. Because people don't die for a lie. They gave their lives. Oh, and when they were called in and the, and the leaders said, quit preaching Jesus, quit talking about Jesus, 
we're going to kill you if you do. It's going to go bad for you. And they said, no, we're going to keep talking about Jesus. You guys got to do what you got to do. We're not going to shut up. He's changed our life. We're all in. We already died. What can you do to us? We love him. He's our king. He's our savior. And Jesus changed these guys' lives. Just like he's changing your life. He's changing my life. He's helping me grow as a passionate Jesus follower. And I'm convinced that this is a missing piece that, that we tend to neglect or maybe don't want to hear. Or maybe it's not talked about often enough in the church. And so we're, we're doing the right things. We're reading our Bibles and going to church and hearing sermons and going to life group and whatnot. And if there's like something that's holding us back, like we're not really growing, I think this, I think this is it. I think we are deceived into thinking that the Christian life is something less than surrender. That it's something less than going all in for Jesus. You know, you know I'll tell you my struggle, and maybe you can relate. I fall into what, what I want to call like a lifestyle Christian. Become a good lifestyle Christian. Bible reading, church service, couple of life groups, pretty much keeping the rules, at least enough that I don't get fired as a pastor. But what about the passion? What about Jesus really number one, like my main love, my main affection, my main go-to, relying on him, consumed with him? That's what we're talking about. That's what I want. That's what Jesus is saying here. And then kind of the knockout at the, at the end, verse 38, if, if there's any of us that say, I don't know, that's hard teaching. I don't know that I like it. I don't know that I agree. I, I, don't, I don't know. It kind of turns me off. Well, thank you, Jesus. Look at what he says here. If you're ashamed of me and my words, what does he say? I'll be ashamed of you. Now, I don't even know what that means. It just doesn't sound good. Right? I mean, we get this. You imagine going to the store and your spouse says, can you stay in the car? I'm kind of ashamed of you. <laughs> I mean, that's brutal, right? <laughs> that's not good for relationships. We can do that with the Lord, and he knows. He knows if we're ashamed of him. And so he's like, don't be ashamed of this. Don't be ashamed of me. I've got the words of life. I made all this. I know where it's all going. I'm better. Like, wh wh and why do we do this? Again, it's not a have to, it's a get to. He's better. That's why. Like I said in the beginning, if you know something else better, follow that. And let's talk when, you know, it's not working out for you. Jesus is better. So I'll close with this. So my, my youngest son, Cody, got engaged Friday night. Yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, she actually said yes, uh, Kenzie. <laughs> so I need to have a talk with Cody. We got to have a talk. And because I, I need to make sure he knows a couple things. First of all, I, I need to make sure that he knows that his life is over. <laughs> right? Pretty, pretty much Christian marriage, good Christian marriage is a funeral. Right? Because you're standing before God and for people, before people, and your single life is coming to an end. Like the old you. Like, Cody, you know what this means. Like, doing whatever you want to do, like whenever you want to do it, those days are over. Okay? <laughs> and, and like, you know, the buddies, going out with your buddies, like, you know, any night of the week, doing what you want to do, forget it, son. Those, 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 those days are gone. And like, you know, buying what you want whenever you want. No, sorry, when you get married, like, you're like one. Right? You can't do that. And coming home and just like, oh, I'm just going to veg out, just clicker, remote, you know, and, you know, chips, whatever, all night long. And she says, how was your day? And you say, good. Like, that's not going to cut it. Right? She's going to want details, details, details. She's going to want you to communicate with her. And you're going to have to talk. You don't want to talk. Okay? And I go on and on and on. I don't know that I'm going to have this conversation with Cody. But if I did. He would say, 
yeah, Dad, I know. And he doesn't really know yet, but he will. <laughs> but he's got a good head on his shoulders, and he, I think he understands, at least in a small way, that his life's coming to an end. But you know what he would say? He'd say, I know, Dad, but she's better. She's better. She's better than whenever I'm going to have to give up in my single life. And is it in the same way Jesus way better? Whatever he says to stop, to start, to walk away from, it's because he's better. He doesn't do and say any of that to rip us off, to destroy our lives. He tells us that to move into life. He's better. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence here today, for teaching us, for loving us. And, and this is a high bar. But anything you ask us to do, you also give us the resources to do through your Holy Spirit. I pray if there's anybody here and they've not started as a Christian, that today would be that day to be born again, to, to have their sins forgiven. And if this is you, it's simple. You say, Jesus, save me. Uh, you have won me, what you did on that cross. Taking my place, offering forgiveness for all my sin. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, I'll take that. Come in, change my life. I begin brand new today. If you just prayed that prayer, I just want to congratulate you and encourage you to let somebody know. Don't, don't be quiet or secretive about it. For all of us, God, may we be people that go all in as a way of letting you know how much we love you, that you're better. In Jesus' name, amen.